You specify what you want to build, the AI asks for clarification and then builds it. That's the philosophy behind GPT Engineer. It's able to create an entire code base from just a single prompt. And it asks clarifying questions about that prompt in order to be able to determine what to build. In this video, I'll show you how to install it. We'll build a custom application and then we'll move on to what I find most interesting, which is understanding how all the code behind it actually works. So with all that said, let's get on with things. So this is GPT Engineer by Anton Seeker. Over the last month, it's had a huge amount of stars on GitHub and a huge amount of interest. And uh, the important thing here is it, it says it can create an entire code base. But the way it does it is really interesting. The in fact, it asks for clarification about what you're gonna build. So it's not a single prompt that you're giving it, you're giving it a number of clarifying points. So when it was first released, the only way you could install this was by downloading it and cloning the repo. Uh, they've actually got a PyPy package now. So as this is installable with pip and it's able to get um, from PyPy, I want to keep my dependency separate. So I'm going to keep this in a virtual environment. So we do Python minus M VM for the VM module and then the name of the VM. So I'm going to call that VM, which is slightly confusing, but there we go. Um, we can see that you've created a new virtual environment there in the directory that I'm working in. And then I'm just going to activate that um, virtual environment. So we do source VM bin activate. Um, and then we can just do pip install GPT engineer. And if we actually take a quick look at this, we can see the dependencies on this aren't that great. OpenAI is the main one here with Typer being used for the command line. Everything else is fairly small kind of um, tools there. So that's installed fine. The next thing you're gonna to wanna to do is get an OpenAI API key. The uh, way you do that is head over to platform.openai.com. And in this drop down over here, you can see your API keys, head in there and generate a new one for this particular project and then export it onto command line. So I've got that and I can just do export open AI API key like that and then paste it in. I will be getting rid of that uh, after this video is published so you won't be able to use the key if you're thinking <laughs> that way. So next we need to create a folder that mimics this kind of project's example structure that has a prompt within it. So I'm just going to create a project's example folder. And then within that, let's create this prompt file. And a lot of these videos that are showing you how to install and use it will just go straight for this prompt as a demo. Um, what I might do is tweak this slightly. So I've gone back to OpenAI and ChatGPT and say, give me a project specification for Space Invaders game written in Python. It should be specific enough to enable an AI to create it. Let's see if that. And this is uh, 3.5. Okay, let's take that. And I'm going to copy that entire prompt into this prompt here. So now I have this prompt which gives a long specification about how Space Invaders should work. And we're just going to say GPG, GPT engineer projects example, Let's see what it does. See if it needs any more clarifying points from that. What is the exact size of the game board? How do cells does it contain? Okay, so I've answered a bunch of questions, but actually got to the point where some of the questions were so specific that I didn't know the answers to them. So I've just gone continue you answer them to uh, to GPT engineer. And you can see that it's creating, creating the files now with, a, looks like using Pygame. And one of the things I think is interesting about the way these are created is depending on the complexity of the project means you're going to be charged more. So the more files you got to generate, the more queries that will go on, um, and hence the more you're going to end up paying on OpenAI calls. I am at the moment able to use GPT-4 API, and therefore it's going to be costing me that little bit more because it um, 
GPT engineer defaults to using uh, GPT-4 over 3.5. It'll fall back to 3.5 if you don't have access to GPT-4, so you don't need to worry about that. Now it's finished and it's asking me, do I want to execute this code? Pip install the requirements and then Python main. So let's see. Let's say yes and actually see what happens. All right. So because I answered yes, and I, but I didn't press enter, it didn't execute the code. That's possibly a little bit. Um, <laughs> it probably should accept yes as well. But anyway, and it's asking me if it ran at all, but I've not actually run it. So, so that has not gone well. <laughs> It's basically created a file with main and a game and all the uh, models that it's using for the game it hasn't created. And I had a quick look over on my usage and the only thing I've done today on um, OpenAI is create this. So all those clarifying questions and everything, that's cost me 40 cents. So that's obviously using GPT-4 um and that bit more expensive but still for something that fails it could end up getting quite costly if you are going to do that a number of times anyway what i might do is change this prompt to something a little simpler so let's completely delete this and start over okay so i'm going to go with an api that serves dad jokes that's probably Fairly, hopefully fairly simple in comparison. Let's see where we get with that. So it's asking me some clarifying questions. So I'm going to say it's going to be stored in a text file. Let's say it just returns it as text. I put test, so hopefully it can deal with that. We only need to handle a small number of requests and that it's just responding with a dad joke and that it's coming from a text file. So hopefully it's able to cope with that. Okay, so this time it says, if yes, press enter, otherwise type no. Let's just press enter. Okay, so we have an app running. Let's have a look in the workspace, see what that is like. So you need a jokes okay so this is dead simple it looks like it requires a jokes.txt file so let's create that let's just ask chat gpt for some dad jokes i'm a dad so i'm allowed to do this yeah so we can see from the jokes.py that it is um returning from the, each line a particular joke and then it's just stripping it and returning it anyway so I think what we might have to do is restart this oh that's interesting so if you immediately just go ahead and ask it to install it puts it straight into the virtual environment that you've already got so we've got all the requirements for GPT engineer, but it's also bunged in within that because we've got an activated virtual environment. It's also popped in our requirements in, in it. So probably not recommended to go ahead and try and execute it straight off the bat um, because it just dumps it straight into that virtual environment as well, which is not ideal. Okay, so we need to go to joke, joke. Okay, cool. So that is that is working, which is good. I might actually dip back to the usage and have a look at that again and see how much we've used over and above. So we used 39p on that Duff um, call out to create the Space Invaders game. Let's see how much we're up to now. So that is another 30 cents. Wow, it's pretty expensive, isn't it, to um, do these things then if you're using GPT-4. I recommend that you um, configure it so that you're using GPT-3.5 while you're trying things out because it's a lot cheaper. So yeah, best part of a dollar on um, testing there. I think I probably typed more in clarifying questions or clarifying answers than I did, than is available in the code. So you see we've only got like, 16 lines of code there 
Anyway, it's still fairly impressive. The thing I wanted to move on to and talk about as the main part of this video is actually how it does this, because I think the code is really interesting. So let's clone this locally and take a look at it. Now, I think this is fairly interesting because I've had a brief look at this and there's a few things that I wanted to comment on. So the structure of this, most of the code is within this GPDE engineer folder. And if you take a look at this, uh, we have AI, we have chat files, we have collect, uh, DB, domain, learning, main, and steps. This first file that we want to take a look at is basically the structure of a conversation that is between um, GPT engineer and OpenAI. So you can see we've got a bunch of convenience methods there for structuring the data, the format of the data that's going back. Chat to files file that we've got. So this seems to be taking a conversation and figuring out what files need to be generated from it. This collect file is basically some analytics by the looks of things that um, they are, I think this is probably what they're sending back as part of the learning stuff afterwards, or it's asking, did this work or whatever. And this is a key value store. So we have a bunch of, this is data, so this is called database and it's a key value store. You notice all these files are really small. They're not very big. Um, and so we have, there's a number of different um, databases there. So there's some for memory logs, prepoms, input and workspace. Um, domain, I guess this is probably the domain that we're working in, but I'm not sure, just a single line there. So yeah, this is the learning. This is, uh, again, the clarifying questions at the ends. So in this file, you can see this is the main file. So this is where we're actually, where it's actually constructing the kind of main command that you're able to use on the command line. You can see it's using typer here for its command line arguments and setting everything up, making things simple. Um, we can specify the model, model in there. So it's probably something that you want to do if you want to use 3.5 and uh, perhaps get some less less good code, but cheaper. <laughs> Um, certainly the experience I've had here is that it can get expensive fast. Yeah, so this is literally just running through all the thick bits of code that we've just seen and setting everything up and using it. And then I think the main, this is the main kind of steps, all the different steps. And I think this is customizable by the looks of things if you look in the repo. So you can go back and uh, decide which of these steps and how you want them to run. And in fact, actually, they're all at the bottom here. So you can actually, so you've got customizable steps here and what, depending on what config you're using, and you can decide how that's configured. So you could actually add your own ones here. Yeah, so I looked at this and I actually totted up. So you can see we've got 67 lines there. Like I said, these are all small files, 40 lines, 40 lines, 56. What struck me about this is that the complexity doesn't seem to be in the the actual kind of structures and how it works. It's, it's all fairly easy to understand how it's uh, doing this. It's actually in these pre-prompts. So the prompts in order to get OpenAI to do what it wants to do, you can see this. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine files here. So with the code, I tied it up and it was about uh, 745 lines in total. So it's barely anything really in the grand scheme of things. Here, you can see these prompts. Some of them are quite complicated and you can see where it's generating um, tests and getting feedback. It's just really interesting that actually the majority of the complexity seems to be in these prompts. So you're going from figuring out how to write something in code to how to prompt open AI in order to generate code for you. And as we've seen, that code may not work, where in the case of, say, the joke API, it would have been far quicker for me to go off and probably look at the documentation, figure out how to read a file and do it that way, because it was 10 lines of code or whatever. Instead, what we've actually done is we spent a little bit of money and in order to get code that is works but doesn't have any documentation and is slightly buggy so the developer doesn't necessarily understand how it works 
So yeah, let me know if you've had more success with tools like this. Um, I'd love to hear your feedback. Consider subscribing to the channel, like the video, all that sort of social stuff. And I'll speak to you soon, new video. All right, bye for now. Bye.